and the other thing that's important to mention, I think, is the millennial culture. So we all know that what demands are placed on our educators in yeah. the millennial culture. Wonderful culture. It's radical. It's energetic. It's enthusiastic. Aiming for heights and wanting to get there with no sense of delayed gratification. They want it now. Exactly. And uh, they also reflect so much on the mistakes we've made as the previous generation saying, but you took so long to get here. You took so long to get to the point where you are now. So then, obviously, we, we have to obviously sit still and listen and give them a chance. But they're not scared to fail. And I think one of the reasons why they, they, they're doing so well and, uh, in many areas, uh, and there are successes of, of, of <laughs> people that are in their early 20s in terms of success, yeah. in terms of uh, influence as well, uh, is because they, they, they're out there. And in terms of innovation and creativity, often switching off your scared what, uh, you know, Yamarik uh, Lever Hoding can, can set you free in terms of coming up with innovative solutions and creative uh, ideas uh, and become an inventory mind, for example. This episode is sponsored by the Smart Idea Group. Stay tuned for an interview with Roland Claven, the founder of Think Brainwave, to hear more about how teachers and schools can use the Think Brainwave platform to connect with their learners when they need to stay at home due to lockdowns, self-isolation or illness. Use the Think Brainwave platform to teach no matter where you or your learners are. Go visit their website at thinkbrainwave.com. That's thinkbrainwave.com. Today's episode is brought to you by Schoolscape the platform that brings schools and suppliers of schools together. Whether you are looking to source IT systems for your school or you want to upgrade the infrastructure or even purchase academic materials, Schoolscape is the place to be. On the Schoolscape website, you would be able to find suppliers and source quotes. Next time you'd like to buy anything for your school, pop on over to schoolscape.co.za and find a supplier that suits your needs. That's schoolscape.co.za hi my name is francois nordia and i am a super teacher and this is super teachers unite <laughs> the show that's all about motivating inspiring and supporting teachers and with me today i'm extremely happy and extremely pri privileged to have dr darren green with thanks, me thanks francois thank uh, you we are currently at the schoolscape premiere event where yes. he did uh, he was the guest speaker did a keynote for us and i just thought we have to have to get you and speak about <laughs> teacher wellness because that was a big part of your uh, of your presentation today and I know you're extremely busy so thank you for taking the time no, absolute pleasure and I think it's important for us to just jump into this immediately it's important that teachers look after their mental health and we keep on hearing this from a lot of people but not often that we hear it directly from the mouth of a, a neuroscientist <laughs> somebody that specializes in neuroscience and who is a medical doctor so please, would you just assist us? Why is it so important that teachers look after their mental health? I think people's definition and understanding of the term wellness is a big, big uh, problem mm -hmm. because people live with different definitions of how they define wellness. And one of the things that I think we highlighted here today is the journey of wellness, yeah. how theories started way back in the East with spiritual theories of wellness, where obviously bad things would happen to you if your spiritual alignment wasn't in check. Exactly. And uh, then obviously we went on to a stage where um, uh, we went into the physical theories of wellness, where people in acquiring greed and wealth and new lands wanted to conquer the enemy in, at wartime and look at ways of, of doing this quickly and, and designing strategic weapons. So where do you strike? What kind of weapon do I design to actually wipe out my enemy so I can claim land? and power etc etc and that led to a lot of uh, you know people becoming inquisitive about what's happening inside the body mm -hmm. so they started looking at, at bodies opening them up and looking at the at the tree of blood vessels and where they all go how the brain structure connects to the spinal cord and how the nerves come off that and move into the different uh, parts of the limbs etc so was this fascination it's getting fascinating to, getting to know the body so that you know how to kill the body <laughs> that's quite <laughs> ironic hey yeah but then we had these wonderful, uh, obviously, uh, scientists and people searching for answers from the Romans and the Greeks as they started 
doing research and looking at, at, at disease processes. And they would describe the, diff- the different humors. They, you know, they'd speak about the humor being obviously water. Uh, they'd speak about black humor and the blood, obviously, how they describe it's fascinating in the literature and poetry even as well. Uh, and uh, how, obviously, the theories then of, of pathology and disease spread then occurred. People that coughed up blood and died, uh, obviously, they'd look for a cause and see, oh, there's a little black spot in the lung. Uh, consumption or uh, tuberculosis or whatever it was then they started uh, getting answers to some of their questions and correlating structure with function on the physical body and a lot of people even today in modern times still focus on theories of wellness looking at the physical well-being I like to call it the meat box and uh, you know we we focus a lot on that and we think when something's wrong with the meat box that we fix it by uh, medication only and as a doctor as a medical practitioner that loves just uh, holistic health. I think that's one of the big problems I have with yeah. with uh, with medicine in general is that we can't only treat with medicine, medicine and drugs and pharma. We need to look at the cause and the, do a root cause analysis and also look at the person's entirety. And why that's important is now in this century and and, and, and age, we we utilize to describe wellness. We utilize what's called the biopsychosocial model. All right. And that obviously refers to your biological well-being, your psychological well-being, mm-hmm. uh, governing obviously your psychology and your, co- your cognitive view of the world. And then sociology, your social uh, norms in terms of your relationships, your interpersonal relationships with colleagues, with family, with friends, in your workplace, etc. So that, all those things combine to give you an idea of someone's wellness index. Yes. You can imagine. So combining biological, psychological and social. So and w- just being physically healthy is exactly. not enough. It's not enough. And physically healthy, can you can still be miserable, develop ha- uh, poor social relationships that cause negative effects on your health, uh, a broken re- heart, a broken relationship, an angry parent-child relationship that leads to great distress, insomnia, suppressing your immune system laying you bare obviously to a host of other opportunistic infections and the effect on that is quite dramatic everyone knows that we are geared to survive to a certain degree when we placed under stress and stress is good in many cases to get us going and to get us off our butts and to get us into action but stress is also uh, can be harmful when it's uh, at the wrong time and when it's the dosage is incorrect. Yes. <laughs> because we need stress just to get us going and just motivate us. Otherwise, we wouldn't learn for an exam. If you don't know that the deadline is coming, we'll just keep on Some putting it Some of us need more motivation than others. Because if you think about stress uh, as well, people that are going through a divorce uh, or uh, going through a job change mm-hmm. or financial stress is another big one. What actually happens to you? Your body obviously is in a state of fight or flight. The organ systems are also brought into this equation. Your poor stomach is pumping out acid. It can predispose you to an ulcer. So often people refer to an ulcer as being part of stress. But the insomnia, the eating habits, the social habits, and then obviously you can either isolate yourself when you start taking strain or you could look for crutches. And what are the crutches we use? We use alcohol. We use drugs. Uh, and then we use bad habits and become addicted to so many other things to help cope with just the inability to deal with the stresses. So when it comes to teacher wellness and educator wellness, I think it's, it's very important to realize teachers and educators are human beings. They're people. They're not some super, super individual who we've glorified because of our absolutely amazing respect for them and in our childhood education who are, who are immune to the effects of stress. Yeah. They're not just robots that we switch off at the end of the day They're and not. put them in the cupboard. And a lot of parents see the role of teacher as, you, you, don't, you shouldn't dictate to me uh, what to do too much because I pay your salary. Yeah. And how many teachers have to deal with that yeah. input as to when to actually zip it when they actually have an opinion to actually vent and get rid of some of their stress. So you can imagine that the role of setting up systems in our teaching systems with the Department of Education and in private institutions as well, setting up structures that al- allow for someone to feel that when they do have an opinion, that they can make a significant contribution and that it's heard firstly and secondly that it's appreciated. So when it comes to wellness, these things all play a role. 
uh, I also touched on the importance of the wellness profile of the teacher and what makes them stay in the profession. Yeah. What keeps them proud? It's not just the feedback of getting accolades and how many A's you get. No, it's not. It's what, lo- <laughs> what, keeps, what keeps teachers in you the know, profession? What keeps, and, and the brain is geared with four questions that a specific structure in the brain asks. The amygdala asks, am I safe? Mm-hmm. You know, it's, in other words, am I physically safe? Am I emotionally safe? Can I trust the people around me? Uh, with information yeah. secondly obviously can I ma- do they make me feel like I can make a significant contribution and when I do do they respect that or is it just shot down saying that's above your pay grade <laughs> you know and then obviously other things are do, do you have a sense of belonging where you work do you feel that you you feel a sense of community am I uh, that is community there, is there camaraderie yes. yes sense of worth and then the, la- the last one is your sense of identity if you as a teacher and an educator can't align your own personal values and I mean our lives our belief systems are all structured around our value yes. systems so if the value systems of the, the, the staff that you are working with or the, or the institution or school that you're working with doesn't align or conflict with your personal values and even vice versa if your values conflict with the school's values you can imagine how much turmoil that creates on a day-to-day basis and the effect that has on your well-being as well so then uh, you might have to reconsider whether you're actually working in the right place or whether you need to change your belief systems some of them to actually adapt which is a lot more difficult which than is just difficult changing sometimes. the place where you work, which is also not a very simple thing to do. No, it isn't. It isn't. And, and the other thing that's important to mention, I think, is the millennial culture. So we all know that uh, what demands are placed on our educators in yep. the millennial culture. Wonderful culture. It's radical. It's energetic. It's enthusiastic. Aiming for heights and wanting to get there with no sense of delayed gratification. They want it now. Exactly. And uh, they also reflect so much on the mistakes we've made as the previous generation saying, but you took so long to get here. You took so long to get to the point where you are now. So then, obviously, we, we have to obviously sit still and listen and give them a chance. But they're not scared to fail. And I think one of the reasons why they, they, they're doing so well and uh, in many areas, uh, and there are successes of, of, of <laughs> people that are in their early 20s in terms of success, yeah. in terms of uh, influence as well, uh, is because they, they, they're out there and in terms of innovation and creativity, often switching off your scared what, uh, you know, Jammerik uh, Lever Hoden can, can set you free in terms of coming up with innovative solutions and creative uh, ideas uh, and become an inventory mind, for example. Exactly. We, you know? we so, so often want to criticize millennials when we forget that we're actually the generation <laughs> that raised them. We did indeed. So, uh, you know, that says that we don't actually have a lot of faith in some of the things we've installed exactly. to, to a certain degree. And, and we misinterpret this this ambition of theirs as, as um, uh, what's the word? We, we, arrogance. As arrogance in many cases and also like a sense of entitlement that these kids have. Yes, yes. And, and, and we criticize that. Them. And they do have a sense of entitlement. The question is whether that's wrong or right, or right and whether it's elevated or not because they feel that they have, they deserve certain answers that they're not being provided with by the current generation. And this lack of patience that you just and the lack of about, patience. Like, we want to answer now, don't wait, don't, don't delay. Now the problem is the role of present parenting plays a massive, uh, massive role in this whole issue that yep. we're discussing. You, you must uh, understand defining a value systems and discussing your your moral compass should be happening at home with parent with parents because that just doesn't depend on parents. isolation that, that's part of the social cultural construct correct it's like you have to absolutely learn that from your parents absolutely now the problem is when that's absent or or it's not in place and it's a little bit shaky the child will look to the person they're spending the most time with for that input, Which for that is guidance. Which the teacher most likely. Well, that's the one thing. And the second thing the children do is they, they mirror behavior. Yes. They mirror neurons in the brain that sometimes do things without thinking about why you're doing them process-wise and analyzing them, but just mimic behavior. Yeah. So they mimic behavior eventually, and it's by chance then that they'll either end up prepared or unprepared to deal with certain things and issues in life. And I think that role of, of, of that missed opportunity with present parenting in the home is often unfortunately passed on to the poor teacher. Because now there's 20 to 40 to 50 of these individuals Correct. gathered together in one classroom. But correct. And, and the problem is the teacher became a teacher for a reason. Mm-hmm. They often want to influence. They have a, a, a appreciation for the humanities. 
and they want to have a significant life. They want to shift capacity and invest. Uh, so it's, it's often uh, regarded as one of the most significant careers on the planet. And that's why, why we focus so much on super teachers, because they don't focus only on the money. If you want to earn money, like, you don't Find want to teach them. There's other ways, of, easier ways of making mm. the same amount of money. But it's that, 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 that notion of I want to make an impact, I want to make a difference um, and feel that, that, that that's that worth that you spoke of yes. in, my, in my career. Yeah, and I think many it, super teachers yes. want that. And influence, if you think of influence, so they might not have the most money and although some of them are so good with working with money, they end up doing very well. Exactly. And some of them that stay in the system and career path well can do well. But if you think about teachers uh, on the whole, they are often envied by many people that are actually jealous and zealous of the uh, of the relationship that a child has with the teacher. Exactly. Parents uh, often need to get on the same side and the teacher needs to get on the same side to move the child forward. But you often find jealousy actually developing because of the the role mod role model modeling that occurs from a t from a child of the teacher. And because the parent is frustrated that they aren't being present they actually feel a sense of guilt and conscience for not being present. And they take that out on the and, teacher. And it gets released often on the teacher uh, and, and sometimes even on the children yeah, for sure. where uh, impatience, irritability, irritability and tolerance issues might come to the fore. So one must understand as well that uh, you know, we, we can't negate the fact that teachers carry a load that is not a load that they are meant to carry, yeah. but they do. And some of them go into the career not also knowing uh, that it's going to entail the intensity and the load. I'm speaking about the emotional energy load that it takes to carry on the offenses of a child coming to school saying, I haven't slept because my parents were fighting, exactly. arguing until three or four in the morning. And the teacher is the one that feels that need, that takes on that emotional, caring, nurturing need. The, uh, and the teacher's children and family is often something that gets forgotten. So, yeah. I, I mean, I'm mentioning that in terms of wellness because their families are often the ones that have to, have to pay the price for uh, either energy that's already expelled, you give out your best at school, and when you come home, how much have you got left? Exactly. But that then you becomes know. a negative uh, feedback cycle here, where at the end of the day, now you don't get energy from the people that you're supposed to get your energy from, and you're, 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 there you uh, go. you're Absolutely. not getting re-energized at home, because now that also taxes on you and gives you extra stress. And now you go to school and you take that out on school, and you take all of this negativity back home. So it's this vicious, vicious cycle and then ending up in teachers having breakdowns. Breakdowns, burnout, uh, a rage, outbreak, doing something that they really regret with a pupil, something inappropriate in terms of not uh, controlling, for example, your impulse in a moment of anger, throwing something, shouting inappropriately, not modeling the behavior that you actually have been trying and working so hard to teach the children in your class. But aside from that, the children in your home, yeah. your own home. So as you rightfully said, what's happening is you, you find then on both sides, in your personal life, you're not getting the fulfillment for what you're investing. And then at school, obviously, you feel like you're also not getting the fulfillment that you're investing because it just feels sometimes as if it's just crisis after crisis after crisis. Uh, and a negative uh, example would be something like where the processes in a system just fail you at the same time that you're under emotional uh, distress and tired where, for example, the emails are not working, where, for example, the internet's down, where, for example, you get asked for a late request, a last-minute document that you must now uh, you know, produce for your senior or your supervisor or HOD by tomorrow. And that becomes like the final <laughs> straw that just breaks your back. And, I mean, we never talk about these things. And I think in this forum that, that we're chatting in now, I think it's wonderful. It's a private place where someone can listen to this and uh, reflect on it and say, you know, really, I, I've been through that, I've experienced that. And I think what is important is to start to, start to get to know yourself. Know a little bit about the, your, your boundaries and your persona. Start looking for early identifiable triggers in your persona, in your behavior, and in your habits that can tell you that you're being placed under tremendous stress or that you might need to take a look at setting boundaries mm -hmm. Or just taking a deep breath again uh, for some perspective, stepping back or calling in help. And we don't often think of calling in help because we consider calling in help a sign of weakness. Exactly. And uh, actually what it does show is great self-leadership, governance, 
It's honorable. It's responsible because you're working with people's that lives. We want a role model to our children. Exactly. That no one is perfect. I mean, and and the same. Uh, I think I mentioned to them today was how many of you, if you do handle the situation incorrectly in the classroom, how many of you as a, as teachers can actually stand up in front of the class and say, you know what happened there was just out of context that should never happen and no one's perfect and we're in this journey together and what i actually wanted to teach you guys is how to handle that situation better would be like this but is, wouldn't that, that level of honesty is just a way of teaching because now living fake, faking it till we make it in front of the classroom that doesn't help us but if you're an authentic human being and sharing the human Absolutely. condition with the children isn't that just a lot more special and going to lead to a lot more value for our kids absolutely so we are we and in, in terms of neuroscience we look at the neuroscience of empathy yeah and empathy and kindness are two things that are very closely linked and if you think about it uh, in terms of the ability to be kind to others requires that you look outwardly mm-hmm. so how do you teach a child that's in a normal psychological development phase of self 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 and autonomy to actually start looking outside of themselves and considering you've got to show them the behavior children don't do what you tell them to do they do what they do what you do they do what you do so uh, that's what we need to do they need to mimic what we enact and hopefully not only an act, but what we live truly in our inner being in front of them. And I think all of us strive towards that as parents and as teachers and so forth. But uh, I think one of the big things is know your limits, know your boundaries, look at your, your triggers specifically. And when something's not a fail, you know there's strategies you can have in place. Man, there's so many now that we know of. That's exactly what I wanted to hit on next. What can a teacher do that's now feeling burnout? That's yes. saying, I'm, I'm like on the, on the edge, I'm not going to make it. What can a teacher do? Give us a few, a few yeah, examples. Yeah, a few things would be, I think, discipline in terms of boundaries and accepting your crisis according to priorities. Okay. In other words, there are often so many things that you need to get to do. And a lot of it's got to do with damage control and crisis intervention at the end. So firstly, you need to see what needs to be done and divide that up into tasks of priority in terms of what's my one day priority, my five day priority, my week priority and my month priority. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, if you're deep in it and you need help and you realize you're not even going to meet your one and five, then you need to call in help and be honest. And that's how you start repairing. So you realize that you physically, even with all the, the, the resources and time you have available cannot meet those priorities. It takes a lot to admit. I, I didn't plan as well as I should have to hear, but in order not to compromise the standard of work that I want to deliver or the lives or, or futures of these kids, I need help with the following. I know that I'm going to be able to mean this to someone else in the future. I need some help. And I think any HOD, any headmaster, if a staff member came to them with that degree of, of maturity saying, I'm deep here, I'm sinking, Uh, it's no one else's fault, I haven't planned extensively, there are many factors that have led to me getting here, but I want to do damage control, this is my idea, this is my plan, Uh, these are the things I need to tackle and I need some help, if I'm meant to stick to the timeline, I need help, I'm not coping. And, and then that's what happens. And that's how teams get together, whether you're in corporate, whether you're in a, in, in a, in a, in a government institution in terms of health and, and med- med- medical, or whether you're a teacher, it doesn't matter. The same process needs to happen. But I think there's a lot of insecurities for people in wanting not to admit that I need help because I'm putting up the show of I'm in control. And Correct. It was Correct. the first moment I open my mouth, I'm going to lose my job. So where does that start? It starts with a belief system. Yeah. And we all live by belief systems that are formed and molded by our previous experience, firstly, uh, of our our growing up and parenting, and also by the environment we live in. So if the culture of the school and the staff is that, that if I show show that I need help or if I go and ask, if I consult someone, it's a sign of a lack of of ambition. It's a lack of of, uh, intuition and uh, self, being self-driven and it's seen as as weakness. You've got to go and look at the culture of that institution and say, but wow, uh, are we going to achieve more with the culture as it is? A lot of burnt out teachers all taking absenteeism for a month and a half or six weeks of being admitted to an institution for depression and anxiety. That doesn't help the school at all. Or uh, have our own families where we have neglected children, neglected teenagers and so forth as as teachers that are 
having eating disorders, committing suicide, etc. And I have to be harsh because this yeah. is the reality. The reality. And this is what I see. The, this yeah. is what I see in terms of the profile of, of people that we, that we encounter in various facets uh, of the health and wellness industry. So please remember that. And I think you're not alone. Uh, and, and I think seeing, asking for help as weakness is something that we really need to get over because I promise you, everyone gets to a stage in this profession where you need help and uh, we need to call on that. And the other thing that poor teachers have to compensate for often is uh, the social changes with the, cu- with the, with the millennial culture. Yeah. If you think about the 2D versus 3D models, kids are brilliant at communicating in 2D. They can look at a face, they can even give you facial expression on the iPad or whatever they're using and talk, etc., but when it comes to them actually meeting someone physically, what happens to their bodies, their eye contact, and how they carry themselves in 3D is a problem. Yeah, they can't matter. shake hands, uh, look you in the eye confidently and introduce themselves. And if they get asked the question, they're so used to uh, having endless time to answer the question on a, on a WhatsApp group or something else that they also obviously don't know what the timing is of appropriate responses they don't know how to read tone in social signals because they are so used to using emojis to describe yeah. emotion exactly and and there's so much more to the emotional experience and they actually the poor child is actually at a disadvantage because they don't know how to interpret the feeling they have they'll say they have tummy ache when they're actually anxious or uh, or sad or they don't understand what the they, physical they symptoms they put telling it into them words. they can't link the two yes you know, so I think that's quite important. So in the school landscape at the moment, the teachers deal with that. Uh, they also have to deal with the perspective of the communities that they serve. I mentioned particularly that if you don't know the community that you're working in, it makes it really hard for you to really connect and yes. relate to the, to the pupils. Um, Once again, coming back to relationship. Absolutely. Get to know the kids in your class. What makes them tick? What Understand are context, the environment. Where they, what's, what's their story? You know, and the problem is if you don't care what their story is, then, then you shouldn't be there. Yeah. Because then you're not going to build a report and you're not going to have the effect of actually connecting and influencing and changing lives, that, which is why I would hope you became a teacher in the first place. Because, I mean, the perspective simply of the amount of people that live, children that live with both parents is about 35%. With a mother only, 40% of kids live with a mother only in South Africa. A father only. Three percent only, and then neither parents. So twenty-one percent, one in five children, are raised by people other than their parents, and that makes you think. Because if you think about what gives you security and safety, and a sense of belonging and identity, and what you plug into in life, uh, often stems from home. Yeah. If if that area is not not intact or in check, imagine how that spills over into other areas. For sure. No, no wonder that teaching is such a challenging profession and that we should uplift this profession of teaching. Not look down at it. It's like, oh, you're yep. just a teacher. Like saying the words just a teacher, if I hear somebody, I, I really, really <laughs> cringe when they say Are this. you just a teacher? I, I, I said today that they must please realize that they're a lot more than admin people yeah, and please. pen pushers. And I put up a quote uh, from Michelangelo that said, I, 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 I carved into the marble until I saw an angel and set him free. Yes. And, uh, you know, the, that was likened to what they do every day. They, they chip and chisel at our children in the classroom. They chip and chisel at each other in the workplace to actually uh, bring out the most beautiful products. You know, the parents that are all crying and tearful <laughs> at the prize givings yes, and valedictories exactly. and all that forget that the chipping and chiseling that happens is happening daily. Every single So your day. teacher is not a pen pusher. They're not an admin person. And you're not paying them to write and do admin as a parent and as a member of the community. No. Uh, you're actually entrusting to them one of the most precious gifts of all, which is to influence and ready your child to make a contribution to the world to become a significant citizen and uh, an enhanced life quality around us you know exactly darren i think we can we can chat about this the entire day but i know Absolutely. you're you're, you're, you're <laughs> an extremely busy man i uh, want to end us off with maybe just three personal questions if you don't you're mind. welcome you're welcome um, what would you say is your superpower <laughs> i think listening to needs and then uh, directing specifically um solutions or bouncing solutions back to people in terms of moving their capacity around i think that would be something i'd like to be considered a, a power mm-hmm. 
So I think, um, yeah, listening to to influence and listening to understand and change change things. Um, that, that's interesting. That's the second time yeah. that I that I hear people mentioning that superpower. You would think yes. that people that, that have got influence like like talking and when we like very articulate and so forth. But at the end of the day, the reason why we know or we can talk about something is because we listen. And if you There's don't so listen, so much out there, but so much, and uh, you know. The, Every single event that I speak at or interaction and person you meet could be a cashier at pick and pay or a spa, wherever you are. Just remember, there might be a, a hidden moment or opportunity in there for you to actually really see something that ignites something in you that makes you a much better human being. And uh, I mean, I try to teach my children that as well for them to, you know, to look outside of normal places and the only facilitated platforms to look for inspiration to look for innovation and different ways of looking at the world please tell us about your <laughs> super teacher like when you were at school <laughs> tell us you don't have well, to mention the person's name it's just yes like that that individual that really inspired you as a teacher tell us about them wow i've got a few mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, and i really idolize teachers I think if I didn't go into careers medicine, I would want to be a teacher. So for me, I said that from the start. Uh, looking at my primary school career, I have teachers that still to date, 40 years <laughs> later, they're still contacting me uh, and still email me <laughs> uh, saying that from Sub B, which was, <laughs> which was what was that great to me yeah. too. They uh, remember influencing my life and still have shown an interest even years down the line. Big uh, role players in my life uh, in, in primary school. And I grew up in KwaZulu Natal at Eastwood Primary, actually. Uh, poor resource area, very little. But so much uh, pride and, friend and, and, and friendships because I had play. Yeah. I had so much play. It was the happiest place for me to play. And I only realized years down the line that we actually didn't have many resources. I didn't know when I was actually you, you a, a little picky that without, uh, you know, when we'd run around barefoot or whatever and we would be providing uh, loaves of bread with apricot jam for the community because the, the kids didn't have uh, enough money to send uh, lunch with their children to yeah. school. And the school would fit that bill of buying bread and making sandwiches for the community where I was at school. And so when, when you're I, a child, you don't, I, know you don't realize because you're just happy, everything's there and you're playing and you're having fun. And I look back to, to those days uh, of uh, Eastwood Primary with Mr. Bruce, Mrs. Jason, and Mrs. Burr, and I think back to them, and they installed a sense of pride in that there's nothing too big to dream for mm -hmm. in your life. And then when I went to high school, uh, I went to West End Primary in Port Elizabeth after my dad had passed and we had moved on. Uh, West End Primary, very inspirational, history, geography teachers. Uh, Mr. Stoffels, Mr. Brooks. And it's so funny. I look back now as a medical doctor and I realized how many health problems they actually had. <laughs> I remember some of the health problems that I could diagnose them now. But I remember the passion with which they taught and the way they drove me. And, uh, and the mathematics teachers uh, that just pushed me and pushed me, Mrs. Stoneman. And then I went to high school at Gray High School for boys in PE, okay. which obviously is in the limelight all the time as one of the best uh, boys schools and a lot of uh, obviously credit because of Sia Khaleesi being there as yeah. well. And the school was incredible because it presented me with a platform to actually do and experiment and try absolutely anything. They were privileged enough to have uh, really good facilities, c coaches, teachers, um, and so on. And I, me I met so many teachers there that were influential. They made an Im impact and an impression on my life emotionally, physically in terms of sport and coaching. Um, I mean, uh, my athletics coach was a Springbok sprinter herself, Michelle Durant, and she's now in Canada and in the States mostly. Uh, Mrs. Holiday taught me biology, but taught me also the importance of, uh, of investing in friendships and not just being caught up in, for example, uh, the moment of glory or yes. success. So the significance factors start coming in when you get older and as you move into the, the later stages. The creative flair teachers that uh, you know would do something different you know the oh captain my captain teachers yes, that yes, make yes. you stand on the desk and yeah, exactly. take you the for dead society type teachers you know i had some of those too old herbie stain and then when we look at afrikaans because I, I mean i i wanted to learn afrikaans i'd come from natal i was a soti and yeah. uh, i had a brilliant afrikaans teacher uh kwesi van Stad, and is now the headmaster at paul riss that uh wouldn't wouldn't let me accept that i'm a, that i was so poor uh, in, in Afrikaans coming from Natal 
and gave me the, the tools and uh, absolutely equipped me with the oomph to become a, like a poetry winner, a literature prize winner in matric for, for Afrikaans, mm-hmm. first language. And uh, just confidence, man. So I think confidence that they, that they impart to you is so special. It's priceless. And, uh, it's priceless. and then, the, the, you know, the, the sport, the culture, uh, the, the speaking, the debating skills, to be able to speak in front of a crowd now uh, started way back there then at That's school cool. when I did do debating and, and work with wonderful uh, teachers like uh, uh, Mr. Rila, Mr. Cunningham and those kind of people. If they are out there in the world, they might even hear this. Who but knows? That's the point. I'm so hoping that they're, that they're <laughs> listening to this or watching Amazing this. teachers. And, and if, if they are not and you know these people, please send this on to them because... I will indeed. Th- there's, there's, I think there's, there's the sense of accomplishment in they teachers. Don't, they don't know what they've achieved. They don't the hear point. always, do they? Teachers, teachers plant seeds. Yeah of trees under whose shadow they'll never sit correct so getting to know and hear some of them have passed on you're right this is this is somebody that i had an influence in and look what they've achieved now it's almost an extension of like you had an influence Mm. on their life Mm. and that's how amazing teachers can be it's amazing i recall when i started in grade uh, in grade eight then at six i never touched a rugby ball i was just very fast in sprinting and at gray Big rugby school, you know. Yeah. So I got told, when you get the ball, you run over the try line and <laughs> you dot it down. That, that's all you do. You what, there's no other choice. What I didn't know is that, I, that I'd be moved from the E team or D team within three weeks to the A team, yeah. having not touched the ball before, and I meet a totally new culture that is a hectic culture at Gray. And then the teacher involved, uh, Mr. Neil Thompson, he just didn't make it a big thing. He knew that I'd have to train until it's dark at night. He knew that I was taking six taxis to get to school and back home to school and that I would leave home in the mornings at, at quarter to five when I was in high school, uh, when we didn't live anywhere near the school. <laughs> so he would take me in his uh, combi or, b- or bus after practice, drop me off at the, at the taxi terminus and, 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 and those kind of things are priceless. Absolutely. You know, those are the things when someone, when a teacher puts their hand on your shoulder and says, and says to you, when you've had a tough day, it's going to be okay. And they, no- <laughs> they notice you. You're not just as a little person. You Man, just don't, don't fade away into nothing. Those, are, those, those are adults are noticing you. Investments in your life that you'll never, ever forget. And uh, oh, it's rewarding. So that's why I think it's an honor to give back to the profession of teaching. And thank you for having me here. No, thank you so much. One last final question. Talking about teacher wellness and wellness oh, in yes, general. Yes. Um, what are you currently watching on Netflix? <laughs> or Showmax? Or sure, what, what, what are you binging? Sex Education. Yeah, what a good show. <laughs> no, what a good show. Everybody must watch that. I love it. I, I'm, I'm teasing. I watch that. Uh, I've also I watched quite a lot of uh, the old classics like Friends. Yes. At the moment, I'm reworking on that. Uh, I obviously was a little bit of a common junkie going through the Game of Thrones series oh, and all to. that as well yeah, because yeah. of understanding that. I love the music of the sets as well and, you know, and the set design. So, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot a lot going on there. And then, obviously, I've been watching a bit of what's called Game Changers. Yeah. Everyone that wants to move on to plant-based the diet. Plant-based, yeah. And then my kids are like, yes, we're doing this for one or two days and then we fail and yeah. then we <laughs> we back to some old habits. So, yeah, a lot of challenging new ideas. But... Uh, I don't have much time to watch TV. All the times that I do interviews and talk on TV, I never get to see it or revisit it, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, I, th- I probably watch less than, uh, less than two hours TV in a week at the but moment. But now, here's, here's the point, that you're so busy, yet still you've got time for downtime. Yes, so that makes, that's part of the busyness. Part of the busyness is setting us out the time for the intensity that it requires for you to be present when playing cricket with your children in the dark at night time on the back lawn while mommy's holding the security light yeah. up. <laughs> this, this happened cricket? this week because because obviously I can't leave that out of my day that needs to happen and uh, I need that time and that feeds my soul and it makes me happy so I need to have those moments in my life and I think that uh, we all do sometimes and when you're tired sometimes you like a child you just want to sit down in a puddle and cry and I, I think when you're grumpy and moody and start taking it out on other people, stop blaming them. Just call it what it is. Yes, much. You're yeah. tired. There's you. no much. You're not slow. Dr. Darren Green, thank oh. you very much for taking the time for, for um, doing this interview with me. I really appreciate it. 
Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this episode, please make sure that you like it. If you like what we do here, subscribe on all of the channels. If you're on um, podcast, rate this show. It's important that we share the stories of other educators and we start uplifting each other because we want to unite all super teachers under one banner so that we can make a positive difference in each and every classroom. Until next time, my name is Francois Nordea. This is Dr. Darren Green, and we are Super Teachers. <laughs> Ciao. A show like this isn't possible without sponsors, and I'm grateful for the Smart Idea Group that partnered with us to bring you today's episode. Think Brainwave is one of the platforms that the Smart Idea Group offers, and I had the opportunity to sit down with Roland Claven, who is the founder of Think Brainwave. Be sure to visit their website at thinkbrainwave.com and start teaching online. The Smart Idea Group is also an authorized dealer for PAN Solutions, which distributes the ever-reliable Kyocera document solutions in addition to being an authorized dealer for the Never Say Die Panasonic PABX business systems. They are also an ECN service provider. They are accredited to install, manage and invoice voice over IP minutes over the ECN network. In addition to these global giants, the Smart Idea Group has a smart surveillance, CCTV and access control product range, as well as video conferencing solutions, which has been specifically selected to enable your school's technology. Decades of working with many leading companies has given them a bird's eye view of what good companies do better, enabling them to fine tune their offering and innovate always. Visit their website at thesmartgroup.co. Dot za. That's the smart group dot co dot za. With me today, I've got Roland Clavent from Think Brainwave, a um, very interesting company that I'm excited to introduce to my audience. Uh, Roland, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thanks very much for having me, Francois. Roland, tell us uh, maybe the elevator pitch. What is Think Brainwave? Think Brainwave is a teacher-learner platform where teachers and learners can meet each other online or face-to-face. -face. Yeah, I think that's a very important aspect. Um, We've now realized there's a lot of pressure on the education system and people needing to go online. I mean, it's, it's, it's like we needed a pandemic to show us the, the benefits of working online. But the fact that your company and the platform that you've created also allows for face-to-face -face interaction, I think is, is really beneficial to the way forward in education. What yeah, do you think? Indeed. You know, we've been looking at this for the last seven to eight years. Uh, I remember sitting at WITS um, when I first studied and uh, we calculated that something like this would happen 2020, 2021, 2022. Yeah. We had a crisis in 2007, 8 and 9. So 2008 was your first, your first shock. 2009 was the second shock, which is bigger than the first two shocks summed together. Yeah. So what we calculated was on the se every seven years, there's a bit of a cycle. Um, mathematically speaking, it's point is going into it now. But by 2014, 15 and 16, we should have had a, another crisis. But because of the size of 2007, 8, and 9, it would skip a generation, I guess you could say. Okay. Okay, or it would skip a cycle. So we said, okay, something would happen in 2020, or something happen in 2021, or something happened in 22, and it would, it would escalate accordingly for the next three years. And as we see, we've got coronavirus, or COVID-19, which is ravaging through our, um, our planet. And uh, what's, what's lovely in the sense of the word is that we've actually prepared for this. Um, with, this with this platform, you've got teachers that, are, that can meet uh, their learners online. Uh, learners can stay at home and they can um, isolate themselves. They can also watch video content, so teachers can record content, mm -hmm. they, they place it online in a, in a secure repository. And uh, learners can peruse this content at any time, go through their tests, prepare for their exams and be ready. Yeah, because one of the, the issues we're going to have in the future is maybe not everybody being isolated at the same time, but mm. if you're feeling ill, there's going to be more of a responsibility on you to rather stay at home. Correct. Whether you're the teacher or whether you're the learner, that doesn't really matter. When you're at home, you still want to continue your education. Quite right. And you don't have access to the physical classroom. And what I've seen is happening with many teachers is they're afraid of creating content for an online space. So if you have a, a blended approach to it where you can actually just record 
the lesson that you're currently teaching in class and go. upload that content onto a, a repository yes. and the learner that maybe stays home um, will have access to that content. Is this something that, that the platform does? That's exactly what it does. Okay. And it's not only limited to that. We've got about nine to ten different phases that we're going to roll out. Okay. What we use is A-B testing. So we've got, let's say, a thousand users. We'll expose 500 of users to certain new functionality. If the, the users give us uh, feedback that is not positive, we don't actually use that functionality and we work on something else. Yeah. So there's a, well, there was a five-year rollout, but this, is, this whole situation has accelerated things by at least six months to potentially 12 months. All right. So um, I'm not sure if you heard about the, the, the Western Cape Education Department. Yeah. So they're looking at some sort of contingency plan, working with, I think, Brainwave. And uh, they're looking at the online video content and they're saying, right, well, we need something that's, that can take group classes. And what we currently have is a one-to-one -one ratio, mm -hmm. right? But this is something that we can turn a switch and it'll be ready in two, three days. But that was not something that we wanted to just launch out to the masses. But as we can currently see, there's a demand for a many-to-one scenario where a teacher maybe sits in the classroom and teaches an, an entire class who's sitting in their different locations at home. But they're all tuned in at the same time. And then, of course, you can also still have some learners in class. Exactly. And in the same time, the ones that are in class and you have got the learners mm -hmm. at home, everybody tuning in at the same time, which I think is going to be very important for, for the way forward. Um, just tell me about the current system as it is, because I know teachers, like I almost want to say from, from the, the time that I was in school, mm. I knew teachers doing extra lessons after school, yes. like just yes. to supplement the income. Um, and, and tutoring is a very important aspect for many teachers, especially in mathematics and physical science and stuff like that. Mm. There, I mean, there are tutor centers set up across the country. Across the world. Because there's, there's a demand for extra lessons. I don't know quite if the demand is for extra lessons. Yeah. Put, not, not to be rude, Francois, but um, it comes down to the bell curve. And if you look at the bell curve, you've got a scenario that looks somewhat like this. If you can just trace my hand, it goes like this, it goes up, it goes like that, and it goes flat. Yeah. If you look in the middle, there'd be 50%. That's the kids that are just passing on the mean, on the, yeah. on the mean right? You then come towards this side, and you're looking at 30% at the bottom of that curve, and then the line sort of flattens out. Yes anything from 30 to 0%. Now this group of children are looking to get into that 50%, between 30 and 70%. They're looking to so, get there so because just they just a little pass. bit of improvement, going from a 30 to a 50. Exactly, yeah. it's about the improvement, right? Now these children that are sitting in the 30 to 70 region, they're looking to get from this region into the 70 to 100% region. Yeah. So they're also looking for improvement. Now you look at the guys that are sitting, they might be also looking for maintenance though, they're trying to just maintain their Maintain pass, the 50 and the 60. Maintain that part, you see? Now the guys that are in 70 to 100 are not looking to just maintain, they're mm -hmm. also looking to compete. Yeah. Because they're competing for positions in university perhaps, they're competing with social friend groups, mm -hmm. you know, your top tenors, they all want to stay up top. So I can tell you that I had university, oh, I had um, tutoring right the way through. I remember I used to go there on pretty much on a daily basis for extra math, whether it was for Afrikaans or English and science, I, I had a lot of extra lessons mm -hmm. just to maintain those marks. I didn't want to drop below below the 70% the mark, you know? Yeah, so, uh, um, and I understand the system that it pre provides an online space for teachers who would want to do these extra lessons and the extra support for tutors as it is currently. Well, it's changed somewhat because of this whole scenario. Yeah. Um, let me be honest with you, this thing started in 2012 and it was a pet project while I was studying engineering and I enjoyed it and then it started to grow. So I started to get more customers and uh, I started to hire some of my mates. So my girlfriend at the time was working with me and it just became an ad administrative burden. Yeah. So how it evolved was in 2017, I started developing the software aspect, the platform to manage it and scale it. And I just went and studied finance thinking, okay, well, I need to understand global financials and economics. And here we are now. So from, for the, for the past, let's say, seven years, it was, I was looking at it from a baby point of view. I was saying, right, let's look at this as a tutoring platform, yeah. as a teacher support platform. Because of this situation, well, I went to London to the Bet Expo in 2020, like January now. Yeah. And um, obviously, I saw it was out there and I saw what, what the gaps were. And what I realized is that we need a platform that 
taps into the teachers and helps teachers earn more money and helps schools earn more money while benefiting the entire ecosystem. So instead of us offering just tutoring, what we're doing is we're saying that teachers all sign up, students all sign up, and they pay $1 a month. Okay. So instead of having a one little, a little Johnny that, who's one out of 100 kids, he needs an extra help, you know, goes for an external tutor, school doesn't benefit, teacher doesn't really benefit because she doesn't get recognition or he doesn't get recognition. What we're saying is onboard all 100 learners, mm -hmm. onboard all five, let's say five to 10 different teachers in the school, and then say to the school, right, we would recommend that you incentivize all of your teachers to work together so that they need to do at least two hours of tutoring on a weekly basis. If you're looking at five teachers times two hours, that's 10 hours per yeah. week, 40 hours in a month. Now, these uh, lessons that, get take, that take place, the money gets paid a really cheap rate. You know, I'm talking about ridiculously cheap. So yeah. everybody in the school, if their kids are sitting at 30%, they can get to 50% easily and cost effectively. So now these kids all get help. Teachers then see value. Teachers earn an extra revenue stream, not through us, but through the school, because we help the school out. We say, right, school, here's all the commissions come to you. Okay. You can use this for scholarships. You can use this for bursaries. You can use this for your facilities. And please, please improve your teacher salaries. Yeah. Because teachers are falling off. Because at the end of the day, if the teachers are going to spend their time on, on improving the, the sure. results of the kids or just aiding them in learning, then of course that benefit should come back to the teacher. Oh, should be and, not, and not necessarily just monetary, mm. um, even just in, uh, improving the, the classroom situation, um, building more classes, so you've got less kids per class and the ratio between the teacher and the student comes down. So, of That's course, a big issue, that. Of course, all teachers would want more money in their pocket, but at the end of the day, if your work um, um, circumstances are improved through being part of a program such as this, it yes. benefits you. Uh, I like that word. I like that word. Excuse my pointing. But it no. gets really exciting. <laughs> That's the whole idea. This is no longer a tutoring business. This is a program. This yeah. is something that the government should have actually thought about, I would say. Like, why didn't they not come up with something that, that actually helps the entire ecosystem of education? Mm -hmm. They don't have to. They've got the private enterprises to, to, to fund, I guess you could say. So luckily we've got this scenario and we will only build on it and grow. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely like this. Now, tell me, what, what is it that you still need um, for Think Brainwave? Um, who would you like to, to onboard be part of this program? That's difficult. It's a very broad question. Yeah. Very but broad. Let's, let's say within the next mm. like three to six months, who, who would you like to, to onboard onto the system? I'd like to get some ambassadors. I'd like to get people like yourself. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get um, backing, not not necessarily financial, but government backing. Yeah. So I'm not sure if you read, but the Department of the Trade and Industry, they sponsor all of my expos to okay. go abroad and try and expand the, the business. Good. Okay. And it's not just about expanding the business. It's about learning what else is out there and bringing it back home and, and implementing it here. Because from a technology point of view, it's not the most difficult thing for us to implement what we see there. Yeah, it's getting the getting the support exactly. to, to roll out a platform such as this. Because obviously there's benefit, not only to the learner, but in this instance for the teacher to also upskill the themselves. And the school, it, in, in essence, because the school is the microcosm of the community, Great. it just improves the community as a whole. Oh, get goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I like it when we have conversations <laughs> like, like this way, because it's all about motivating, yeah. inspiring, supporting teachers. But at the end of the day, why do we want to support teachers? is so that they can uplift the community. Yes. And the, uh, this is my personal philosophy, and in a prosperous globe, empower teachers. Empower your teachers. Because they've got influence. 100%. If you look at a teacher and you look at a doctor, what are the differences? A doctor fixes a problem. A teacher prevents a problem from occurring. Yep. I think a teacher is very, very important. They're very much undervalued in society. Because it's, it's, it's not necessarily the teacher as the individual, but it's the, it's the education behind this. When people are empowered through education, they know how to prevent themselves from getting ill. Right. Um, I know everybody is, and it's very soon everybody's going to have COVID-19 fatigue mm. and people don't, wouldn't want to talk about it. But the more information that we can have, the better yeah. we can, can prevent um, future issues like this. And that'll come through education. Well, quite right. I mean, if you look at, say, I was, I was thinking about this a couple of days back, maybe a week ago. If you look at the Black Plague, do you not think that the population at the time would have been better off if they'd actually known about the Black Plague? You know, if they had social media, if they had proper means of communication. Yeah. And the scientific literacy and that, goes, that goes with it. 
So unfortunately for them, science wasn't developed into such a stage to really understand the nature of the microbiology. We are in an age where we can understand this. Mm. Yet some people choose not to be scientific literate. And it's the job of the teacher um, to assist our learners from a young age to do that. And unfortunately, now is not the time to want to do it only in the modality of face-to-face, -face, mm. but to also now include online spaces to do this. Quite right. I'd like to just throw a quick spanner in the works. You're welcome. What do you think about the social impacts of COVID-19? And uh, how do you think it's going to impact our society? Well, the, the major challenge, um, and just speaking from an education point of view, mm. what, what COVID-19 is doing, number one, is ex it's exposing the digital divide. Mm. And it's actually um, increasing the digital divide because it's the people who've got access to online platforms that now get quality education where in the past it was facilities and, and, and geographical issues mm. that um, kept people, and polit political issues of course, that keep people away from quality education. Now it's the access to the internet that's thrown on top of that, mm -hmm. that's creating this further social divide, mm. um, which we should really guard against. So I'm, I'm all for a platform such as yours, uh, but we also need to find other modalities. Yours is uh, one of the solutions within, mm -hmm. within the ecosystem of solutions. Should we guard against it or should we come up with, with a potential solution? You know, no. Provide devices, provide internet access, uh, provide options that are affordable. I think, that's, I think we're, we're often still thinking in the Iron Age where it's all about protect our resources yeah. and kick everybody else out. Why don't we start thinking in more of utilitarian mentality and think why don't we share our resources together? You know, you've seen this whole bog roll or toilet paper situation where Oaks are, they walk into the shop, fill their trolleys with toilet paper. Why? I mean, you're going to blow your nose or you're wiping your bottom. Yeah. You can easily just jump into the shower. So, be, be, be respectful about our resources. Just because you can financially afford to pay for everything, you know. I'm not saying yourself, obviously. I'm no, just, no, saying, no. In just commenting on the people that are behaving in this way. And um, I just feel that, you know, the poor can't necessarily afford, you know, from a capital point of view, to pay for their food and buy in bulk and put it into their freezers like the wealthy can. And I think it's, it's often the duty of the wealthy to care for the poor because if they don't care for the poor, the poor will come after them because they'll starve and they won't starve to death. And we and we and we see we see this in history throughout many of the revolutions uh, that occurred. And it's maybe time that we that we learn from this. Thank you. It's Stop very, cycling. Exactly. It's very short sighted of us hoarding, mm -hmm. whether it's toilet paper or whether it is access to the internet. Yes. But um, mm -hmm. we need to understand long term that we need to grant everybody access. Mm -hmm. um, what they do with their access is totally up to them. I mean, we need to train them on how to access and how to manage. And once you've got the access, because face it, there are so many people who've got access to the internet, but rather choose to entertain themselves and surf the net and go onto social media and like booty pics. But it's, <laughs> what do you do with your education? Yes. Once you've got access, how do you upskill yourself, especially in a time like this? Well, something I've realized over the years is the more educated you, you are, generally speaking, the more you want to learn because the more you realize that you actually know nothing. Yeah. Whereas when you're ignorant, you generally think that you know everything. I know for a fact that when I was 18, I thought, well, I know a lot about the world. And uh, I walked out into the world and it gave me a running kick slap to the face and I started learning that I need to learn. Now, this is the situation we sit with, with the uneducated, the illiterate. Of course, they're going to be looking at booty pics because they know they don't know any other. Yeah, you know, they they think that's the way of life. They're trying to they're still working on an egotistical uh, based lifestyle. And we want to emulate that so that we can get the admiration exactly, and we like move up in the social hierarchy. Correct, correct. Yeah. Now, if one is to educate them, and this is why I think Brainwave wants to do one dollar a month. That's the whole concept of this. Yeah, if we can get it out for one dollar a month. Governments will pay or parents can pay out of their airtime, for instance. Ideally, we would want to get funding from something like ACETA, that's yes. whose, whose, whose whole mandate is around skills oh, development. Now we can discuss. So that's, that's, I think, an avenue. But at the end of the day, making it as affordable as possible gives more people mm -hmm. access. And I think what we'll also see now going into the future is this pressure on government, knowing that, you know what, we actually need to start rolling out access to, to internet mm -hmm. um, for the entire country. Well, why not? Why don't we do that? 
um, you know, government's got so much to do. I mean, we always put so much of a burden on, on government's hands. There's thousands of people trying to handle ten thousands of problems. Yeah. So why don't we take initiative, do it ourselves, and then say to the government, right, this is what we're doing. Uh, would you Please like to us. back us? Yeah, I think that's the that's the important thing. I think that's the role of government. They don't mm. necessarily need to do everything, but because they're receiving um, our taxes, because use the money to empower everyone. Correct. And a platform such as this that gives um, um, very uh, cheaper access to the internet is something that's worthwhile. Yes, but let's go back to seat a moment right here. All right. So I spoke to a guy called Mother. I don't want to say obviously his surname, but um, so he's with Prime Media, 5FM and Talk 702 and all that. Just popped into him a while back and um, so he likes what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. And I sent him an email uh, yesterday and I was discussing CETA. So I thought to myself, how could we make this platform free? And then I clicked. So CETA pays for the teacher's salaries. One could simply train and upskill these teachers from CETA. Let's say we take a thousand of them, mm-hmm. right? We place them on the platform. We give them rigorous training. We upskill them to a level that they should be at, you know, where they could teach at a top, top level, at a super teacher level. And the government co- covers their fees and we give free access to underprivileged children nationwide. What we also do is we pay for uh, Wi-Fi and we pay for internet access, whatever it takes. We place it in these areas, call it the Eastern Cape in the Lullies, call it uh, Social Gouvern, Pretoria, uh, talking about, let's say, uh, Soweto's already set up as far as I know. Set these places up with a Wi-Fi setup. Don't don't get someone random to do it. Come to us and say, right, you guys, find the right partners, get it done, and we will make sure that they get paid. Cool. We get it done, get these teachers on board, we have these kids learning. Now I think this is a way to tackle the, the un, you know this this population that can't get educated because it's all well and good. We'll we'll tackle the five to ten level LSM. Those kids have access to an iPhone or they have access to a smart device. They have access to Wi-Fi or they can go to the Wimpy. But a lot of the children that are sitting in environments that are not conducive to learning because parents often are not comfortable with learning because they're illiterate themselves, those children need to be empowered. Those are the ones that we need to go and say, right, you can have education for free. We'll even educate your parents if you'd like. Yeah. Now, that is the kind of impact I would like to have on this planet. Absolutely. And I, I, I agree with you. It's not only going to be the learners that need to learn. It's going to be the adults 100%. that need to do it. And what we're currently also seeing is there's so many retired teachers whose expertise is getting lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is a, an untapped resource. And face it, people are getting older, much older. And living than, for longer. And outliving their pension. So our, our retired teachers mm-hmm. will need to find a way of, of subsidizing their income and the, uh, subsidizing their, their pension. Mm-hmm. And a platform such as this gives them the opportunity and gives us access um, to experienced teachers. Mm. They'll need to be upskilled on how to use online platforms, but I mean, none of us grew up um, knowing how to drive a car. We learned how to drive a car. I like that analogy. So if you're if you're eighty like years old, ride a bicycle. Yeah, <laughs> if you're eighty or you're ninety years old, um, that doesn't mean that you can you need to stop learning. Why should you? No. You're going to live till 100, 120. That's another 25 years. Well, if you look at this, COVID doesn't kill off like 5 to 6% of the population. You'll start mm-hmm. seeing people living to 100, 120. Yeah. And the more healthy we can be now as, as young, younger individuals, we'll the, more, the, the greater chance we have to live much longer. Mm-hmm. Roland, thank you so much for the time that, that I could spend with you this morning. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we can I'll speak about for this for we can speak about this for, for ages and ages and philosophize, but the important thing is we need practical solutions. Mm-hmm. And I really think a platform such as Think Brainwave is definitely a, a solution to our challenge. We need synergy and that's what we're looking for. Awesome. Roland, thank you so much. Thanks, Francois.